So anything else we need to go over before we start? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I'm good to go. Why? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fuck me. I swear you wait. You're like, wow. hold, that, hold. I mean, we were, we were th five seconds from five, starting. Yeah. It's uncanny. <laughs> Christ. Can you put yourself in that while you're at it? What's up, guys, and welcome to episode 10 of our Coffee and Beer Fuel Gemmo Gamer Podcast. I am your host, Van Hill, and joining me, as always, is my co-host from the opposite time zone, Mr. Evan Piotrowski. Uh, hi. I'm... Oh, what? I, we got no song? No, I got three banked, but uh, someone is sleeping in the room. She doesn't need to sleep. She needs a song. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I... Uh... <laughs> so I got like, you know, we, this is a fortnightly podcast. I got six, I got three, so, that's three songs banked. That's six solid weeks. Um, I just thought of a new one while I was cooking the other day. It's a, it's a, you thought of a new one. It's, that, that's hilarious. It's a, okay. It's a solid one. It's a, it's a mashup of, uh, uh I'm, I'll right. give it away, but a uh, Metallica and Legend of Zelda. Uh, I got the lyrics down. Oof. L lots of, lots of, uh, hype, lots of going through the lyrics in the shower or running. Because it it has it, it it has to rhyme, but also make sense of. But the anyways, um, yeah. There's a very thin... yeah. I, I love I love that you're enjoying this so much. Like that's that's all. It's oh man, about. I got some. And I hope I, I hope someone out there is. I got some bangers, man. Just just you wait. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's a very thin, and you know how walls are in Japan. It's like not even a wall. Right. There's a thin sliding door between the living room and the bedroom, and uh, yeah. Just gonna have to uh, have to hold off this time around. Wait, wait for next episode. Uh, sorry, sorry, to, yeah, sorry to disappoint all our listeners, but uh, you know, it's probably like we probably just lost like a third of our listener base. Like, yeah. just, well, well, no song. Fuck this shit. I'm, I'm gone. I'm out. I'm out. Uh, Peace. I will say, uh, you know how like uh, whatever um, people who are going on stage in the green room, they'll be going through like their chords, like la 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 la. <laughs> Uh, like I, I, I don't know how many movies I've seen where they're doing that, but anyways, right? Like, it's the typical trope. Yeah, you, you get. I get it now because uh, I hadn't said anything for quite a while, and then going from not warming up your voice to going into a song, it just is not good. It just doesn't sound great. <laughs> Basically, I'm likening mm. myself to you know like a Christina Aguilera. I think is is that okay? I mean, how old am I? That that was the first name that I thought of. Right, I was gonna say, man. It's like I, I don't think half of the people listening to this are gonna know who that person is. They're gonna be googling it, like, "Wow, she looks old." Like, who is she? Uh, they might like, know her from The Voice. She might have been on The Voice at some point, or I'm, I don't know. I haven't lived in the states. See, that's how old I am. I don't even watch that show. So yeah, I'm I'm totally out of the loop on that stuff. But anyway, like uh, back to the topic at hand. How are you doing, man? How is how is life? Good. I'm uh, drinking some Hawaiian coffee today. Okay. Yeah. How is it? Is it is it bitter? Is it sweet? Is it is it crap? Is it good? Uh, it's pretty good. It's a medium to light roast uh, from Lion Coffee. It's like one of the more well known Hawaiian coffees, and uh, apparently they've been putting roar in your pour since 1864. <laughs> hey, that that's what it says on the back of the uh, back of the bag. Hey man, like cheesier the tagline, the better. Yeah. You know, like. Yeah, we need good times. Uh, more companies need to do that shit. I, I love it when they do that. Yeah, so yeah, ten thirty in the morning. I'm on my second cup of coffee. It's it's light to medium. It's it's probably good for like if you want to drink several cups because it's like really low in acidity. It's not too oh, that's too time. strong. So yeah, it's a, it's a good coffee for that. How about you? Good times. Uh, I am drinking a lovely glass of H two O water. It's a, uh, it's fresh from the Himalayan mountains. It's a, uh, it's, it's been brewed to perfect. No, it's just a glass of water. That's all I've got. Um, I, I will start drinking like something a bit more interesting. I've just, I've recently been like looking into like getting a good whiskey or something like that, oh, wow. or a scotch or something like that because I, I don't want to drink any beer because I just lost a shitload of weight. 
and whiskey is probably better for that. Right. And I want to be able to, like, like I don't drink that often. If I'm honest, like I, like I'm, I'm really a light drinker these days. But like, if it does get to like a Friday night or something, I just want one glass or something. That's that's what I want to start getting into. So yeah, sip, sip. Hopefully and soon it. I'll be able to start talking about that. Yeah, I mean, it's something to sip on. Wait, something neat. Think about yeah. that. Like, let's just say on the beer over it. If I do four beers, that's nine hundred calories. Right, Jesus, a cent, a cent, yeah, a... that's like a loaf of bread. No, wait, no, that's even more. That's like twelve hundred. If a beer is about three hundred calories, so I mean that's right. that's half your day, depending on your weight and mm-hmm. your your height. Think, yeah, that's wild. Thank God I I run and exercise regularly, or I would be in rough shape. That's for sure. But anyways, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What day is it yeah, today? We'll get around to it. Uh, today it is uh, February the twenty third, uh, twenty twenty, and today we're going to talk about E three. But first, Mister Evan Piotrowski, what have you been playing, good sir? Oh man, I've been waiting for this for quite a while. Um, oh god! I, uh... right, I'm just I'm just going to turn off my headphones and I'll leave you to it. <laughs> hey, see you in ten minutes. If take it easy. If you're uh, if you think I'm going to be b- deterred from talking about Yakuza, even if I'm just talking to myself, you are. You might as well just stick around because. The conversation is essentially not going to change. Okay, so, well, we lost half of our listeners when you said that you weren't going to sing. I think we just lost the other half, so just just go for it. Go gold. Like it, it, I don't think it really matters at this point. Oh, I think you're reading the room wrong. The the, the half that we lost, <laughs> we just got back. Okay. That's, that's if they st- stuck around. They're like, okay, I'm going to listen to ten more minutes and... Oh, okay, Yakuza. All right, good. I'm glad I stuck around. Yeah. <laughs> they had the hand hovering over. All right. The so, how is it? One. Like, you've you've been waiting for this game forever. Uh, well, have you? I guess. Like, how many times have you played it? Because it's it's out in Japan. Is it out in the states? Like, no. What's the deal with this game? No, it's uh came out January 16th in Japan, and um, it's going to be lo- lo- localized. I think the uh, you know how they they released the Yakuza Remastered Collection. It was three, four, and five. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you could buy the collection, and then they had released the digital version spaced out over the past couple months. And I think Yakuza Five Remastered just came out in the states, and it had never actually been released on a disc either. And I think in the remastered collection, the disc is in there. So, what I mean, what I mean to say by that is, it seems like the Yakuza releases have been going strong and being localized. You know, Judgment was localized as well, which is kind of like an offshoot game that takes mm-hmm. place in the same area so i'm guessing this game will get localized the only thing is it's got to it's it, it's it, got it, to it, it has to yeah oh no it, it is going to get localized because they already released the logo uh it's called yakuza right. yakuza like a dragon colon like a dragon they, they took oh the okay right so this is like the same okay so this is the same as that i didn't know if this was like a separate game to like a dragon or if it was the same or what but i know that they change the names sometimes so that makes more sense now yeah you know final fantasy 3 final fantasy 6 like whatever right we, 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 if, if if you're knee deep in games online, you, I'm sure I'm sure you realize realize at some point it's the same game, but it will get localized later this year or maybe early next year. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah. So I'm um, sixty five hours into the game. Jesus, uh, sixty five. How long have you had this game? Like you said, it came out in January what? January sixteenth. So I've had it for a little over a month. Yeah, you are like you are like the Yakuza fan now. Yeah. You're not even like a Yakuza fan. You're you're the Yakuza fan. Should I, should I just should I change my? I just do a new Twitter handle. The Yakuza. Yeah, Yakuza. Jesus Christ. The Yakuza. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> um. Actually, it's it's funny. Like if I'm talking about this game with a with a coworker, we we switch to saying the Japanese mafia because if all of a sudden we're talking and then it's like Yakuza and everyone around us would be like, are they talking about the fucking Yakuza? What's going on here? <laughs> so it's kind of funny, right? But um, so yeah, uh, I've been playing Yakuza Seven. I'm on the final uh, chapter. The game is usually f- okay. Uh, Space on about fifteen or so ish chapters. I'm in the fifteenth chapter. So most mm-hmm. of the revelations and the betrayals and uh, the puppet master, essentially, that's all basically been known. Like, here's here's actually what's yeah. going on. Here's what. So you're in like the epilogue epilogue section of the game. I'm so. going up to the final fight, and I think the two right. main things people probably want to know about this game are how is the change from uh, a, essentially a, a 3D brawler to the turn-based battle system and 
how does the new main character stack up to Kiryu, who has been the main character for seven games? Um, and uh, the first one that I guess like the the one the one worry which I did have about the character thing, like before you actually say anything about it, like the one worry which I had for fans, I guess, because I haven't really played the games that much. I've played like a little bit of zero, but I was worried that they were just gonna like make a Kiryu like two point or one point five or so something. It's just like a different character model but it's basically like the same sort of guy like that was that was my only concern when it came to the game um yes and no uh and it's kind of funny if you've noticed uh the suit that he wears is actually just a color swap of what kiryu wear, wears he's got the <laughs> right. the white suit and the maroon shirt and uh the mm-hmm. new character ichiban kasuga ichiban wears a maroon suit with a white shirt and the collars popped oh. of course it's you know it's only 2020 right. i mean gotta keep uh gotta keep in fashion for the <laughs> you time. gotta keep styles yeah. going yeah. um so they are different and i'm glad they're different enough uh they're about the same age i i guess the, the thing about kasuga ichiban is he's more of like a buffoon than kiryu is <laughs> like he's kind of a dummy right yeah and I like that personality trait for him. Uh, he's similar to Kiryu in a way where, like, he kind of has his own moral code, and he's not going to break it for anyone, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's part of it. One thing is he definitely could probably not carry a game like Kiryu does. Like in Yakuza Six, you only play as Kiryu. In some of the other games, you you play as a handful of characters, but Kiryu's story is always the main story. Mm-hmm. Kiryu can carry a game. He's carried several of those games by himself. Um, Kasuga Ichiban is not a char- full a character that I think could carry a game by himself, but he doesn't need to because this game is more about the party, which makes sense because they changed the battle system to a turn-based battle system. And so, oh right, so there's multiple characters in the in the game. This yeah, time. so I think like they probably thought, okay, we're doing a turn-based battle system. Let's focus because like you know the the joke in the game is like he's like a big Dragon Quest nerd and he talks about it a lot actually in in <laughs> in the game. And there's actually a fourth wall breaking moment in the beginning of the game where his friend says, "Man, Kasuga, you're a strong guy. Why do you wait for like the other guy to attack you?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, it's not a fair fight if I don't let him to get one punch in." <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, ha ha, okay, ha ha. It's a turn-based right. battle system. Turn-based yeah. right? Um, so yeah, the 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 game is really about the relationship between Kasuga and his group of people, which is very very common thread in JRPGs, and mm-hmm. it essentially is about him. But the party is more of a thing because even in all the old Yakuza games. When you were playing as different characters, you were just by yourself getting stuff done. It would switch from city to city, but you were only a single character. In this, you're always with your party. And um, mm. you're always either you know sitting around talking in a bar, uh, which actually each character has its own specific side story. And you, you activate that by filling up a, a friendship meter. And when it hits a certain point, you can go to a bar and it activates a a side a side story for each character and each time you do that and you fill up your friendship level i think it's a max five um you get different perks in battle probably similar to Uh, similar to persona i was gonna say it sounds this sounds a lot like the uh social link system actually yeah saying it now it is like that and it's it's cool like you'll get stuff like well even if they're not in your party they'll get uh a bit more experience and and little things like that and or uh uh for example, if you knock a bad guy down, they'd be more likely to get like a kick in to shave off a bit mm-hmm. more more damage if, if your friendship meter is built up. So all the systems are, are in place. Um, so the main character is definitely not Kiryu at all, but he's actually, he's a really, really good character. And that just has to do with like these, this crew is just really good at, at writing, fleshing out characters and uh, I'm fine with having a new character. I'm not like playing this game like, oh, this sucks. Why don't you bring uh, like Kiryu back? It's like, no, I'm I'm fine. I'm I'm happy with this new party. Yeah. Each each character is like they they have uh, their personalities are fully fleshed out. Um, the way that they talk to each other, 
is is really fun like you could be walking around the city and sometimes you'll pass by something in the city like a like a statue or a building and there'll be a button prompt for a conversation and right and, and it, it, it'll just play out as you're just kind of walking around and um it usually they're actually really really funny um and uh it just kind of adds to the idea of like these people are friends kind of talking as they're walking through the city when you're you know moving from point a to point b um but the nice uh, the last thing i'll say is that the turn-based battle system is good it, it's not i i like it because it plays the long game and what i mean by that is these games are massive right i'm it's i'm 65 hours in and i think for a game that long just there's something about the turn-based battle system that that works if it's good Mm-hmm. As long as it's good, right? Let's get, say you're a Persona Four or your Final Fantasy Nine. Like, if the turn-based battle system is fun and engaging, you don't get sick of it. Uh, I some people I think have maybe gotten sick of brawling in some of the other Yakuza games. I haven't, but I'm kind of the exception to the rule. Maybe I can, I can imagine anyone would like after um, like getting what seven entries in maybe eight nine like how many entries are in that in that series se- so. se- yeah seven so yeah it's nice that they change it up and and a couple of things that they do to the art the the system is that that change it up in terms of just it being a turn-based jrpg battle system is um it so when you when you get into battle you cannot move your characters but they'll kind of naturally kind of move around the the battle area by themselves interesting and okay depending on where they are and this is nothing you can control it just depends on where you are and what's around you for example if like you get into a battle and there's like garbage cans kind of close to an enemy he just happens to be next to him when you attack and you you make a beeline for for him um if there's something around you that can be picked up your character will automatically pick it up and hit him with it but that's only Mm -hmm. if it's in the area and if they if you knock an enemy down uh, and it, they're close to one of your party members, your party member will get an extra hit in. But if they're not close to them, they just they just won't. Uh, another thing is like depending on the placement of the, the the enemies on the screen. Let's just say there's like three guys in front of you, but you want to attack like the the big guy that happens to be behind them. If you try to make a yeah. so you click on him, press attack. If you try to go through the the guys that are in front of him, they'll punch you and cancel your attack. So you can't just you can't just choose anyone on the battlefield. It has to be someone who's you have a clear beeline for, or else you can cancel yeah. the attack. But the the stronger you get in the game, sometimes some weaker enemies will hit you as you're beelining for someone, but they won't cancel the attack. Cancel the attack. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah, it definitely plays the long game, and I like it because it's more tactical. And um, later in the game, like the old brawler games, I think you'll you know this it's a very japanese thing like very arcadey where enemies or bad guys will just get stronger in the way that it seems unfair because they'll have like iframes when they're going yeah. through their motions and like they can cancel your hits but you can't cancel theirs because boss it's my oh man like that's my biggest annoyance when it comes to video games like to this day like that's the one thing which i get angriest about is when they they can break the rules of the game that is set to the player like I hate that shit. Like it's the worst thing in human history. I hate it. It's cheap, and it's one reason that I don't play any of the Yakuza games on the hard difficulty setting because right. it's really, really cheap, especially with boss battles. Um, with the turn-based battle system, it completely takes it off the board because now it's just strictly turn-based ta- tactics. So you're using That's you're using though. buffs and debuffs, and uh, you you have uh, they call them delivery help, which are basically summons, and so you get like if you've finished certain side quests you'll get a summon uh the classic character ono michio kun from <laughs> ono michi uh, if you finish a side quest you can summon him which is which is great that's awesome it's, uh, yeah so like that the mascot character with like the uh tangerine for his head huh? yeah exactly uh, yep. he he, make, right. he makes an appearance uh one of the one of the summons is a guy named jay san <laughs> And you fin- is he a far enough? Please be a far no, enough. No, he's he looks exactly like Jason from Friday the Thirteenth, but his name is oh, that's great, Jay, Jason, and he he's a, he's actually a butcher, but he wears a hockey mask for some reason. <laughs> so it's uh, uh, that's awesome. Uh, some on one side quest spoiler, you end up fighting a a, a monkey with a bow tie that a chimpanzee rather that escapes from the zoo, 
and for some reason he jumps into a, uh, uh, what do they call him, a, bull, a bulldozer, or a crane, and he... Right, yeah, I think I saw the uh, video of this on your Twitter, yeah. like, you, you posted the video for this, and I was like, this is bananas, yeah. like, excuse the pun, yeah. but <laughs> it's like, that's wild. But, so yeah, like, si- side stories are great, side quests are your classic absolute ridiculousness, uh... That's good though. Like as long as they don't break out of that, because I think like the the one thing that that game has got going for it is like the comedic aspect. Even if it has got like a super serious main story, sometimes like it, there's just moments where it's just like like in the other in the other games, it's just Kido like fixing people's bullshit like sort of lives. Oh, that that doesn't and change. Yeah, and he's always helping. Right. That that's as long as that's still in there. I suppose fans are still gonna love it because that's that's probably the thing that always draws him back. Yeah, he's like you know, slightly an unwilling participant in other people's <laughs> bullshit. And he just kind of goes along right. with it to, to help them just because of reasons. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, I mean, could go on for a really long time, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's a great entry into the series. They did. I like the change in the battle system and uh, yeah, it's uh it's, it's the classic pendulum swing between the serious, the melodramatic and the absolutely insane side, ridiculous rid- ridiculous <laughs> and the story is really awesome. really interesting there's a lot of things that happen you're like i gotta see what happens in the story so right. i'm going to give it a five out of five stars i don't want to uh blow my six star my first 2026 star rating uh it's too early it's man. too early yeah. it's too early for this shit so it's it, it's, yeah, it's, too it, early. it's really really good it's really good and uh awesome. yep how about you what have you been playing uh yeah this week i played a couple of games but i'll probably only stick to i don't know i'm gonna blast through both of these i guess like real quick but i'm probably gonna talk about more in the next episode just purely because i want to give them the proper time that they deserve uh the first game which i played um i've just started playing is dreams and i've only been playing it like i've only played like a few hours of it like at night but jesus christ this game is amazing um anyone that has any like creativity in their bones whatsoever like they need to go out and buy this thing it's it's um, I think it's like two thirds the price of a normal full price game. I believe so it's if you're 40, in the US, forty dollars US, right? Right. Yeah, it's forty US. It's it's probably like the same price cut as probably on the UK and and all the European versions of the game. Uh, but yeah, like as this this isn't really a game. Like it's kind of hard to describe it as such. Like it has a game in it, like a like a demo mode that you can go and play. I haven't played through it yet, um, and it sort of showcases everything that the game is and. Let's see, I've just said it again, the game. It's not really a game. It's a game engine. And that's the only way you can really describe it. If you're not interested in games design, if you're not interested in creating things and like making anything whatsoever, like if you just want to sit back and play a video game, this thing is not for you. Um, if you're into like, if, if you if you messed around in Fallout 4's um, like base builder thing, or if you're, if you spent hours in Minecraft, like making a perfect tower of awesome, like whatever you did, you need to buy this game because it it takes every it takes all of them sort of concepts and 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 cranks it up to to a hundred, like it's absolutely wild. Like the the amount of stuff that you can do, like it, just go and Google like the the games that people have made or remade. I guess like someone's remade the opening section to Metal Gear Solid, and it looks like it. Someone's remade the the whole of PT, like the demo, and it it, it looks pretty pretty awesome you know it's just this it it's just blown my mind like what people can make out of this thing consider it's just them on a sofa with with their dual shock 4 and that's it yeah i've seen um, i've seen dead space i just saw like the opening teaser of ghosts of tsushima where he he, he yeah hand, how awesome was he that handily like kills the three mongol soldiers they yep. uh, that was recreated in it it's pretty wild i i have a question for you vin as a game yep developer um, I, I yep. haven't had my hands on dreams, but y- hearing you talk about it on Twitter and seeing everyone like kind of gush over it for $40, mm-hmm. that seems like a good buy f- that something I, I should purchase, even if I'm just going to kind of mess around with it as a dev who works on uh, video game and video game design. How are the tools from your perspective to, to, to make these things? Is it like in- intuitive? Is it different in a lot of ways? It's different, but it's different in the right way. And I mean, it took them seven years to make this game, and you can see why. Like, as soon as you pick it up, like, you if you open up the game and just open up the editor and you look at all the options or whatever, you'll just be sad, like, yeah, fuck this. I'm not, just exit out. I'm, I'm done, sort of thing. Not, uh, that's not for me. But if you, like, just play through the first tutorials, 
like the first like three tutorials which are like five minutes each like you start getting a knack for it and you start to understand it and then you realize how simple all the tools are but how in depth they all go as well like just how it's it's kind of what like to on a layman's level it's kind of hard to describe like how they've done certain things like it's like in the like some people will know what this means but the the game objects themselves aren't actually 3d models completely they're sort of voxel based so they're kind of like 3d vector objects like some people will know what that means so it, it allows them to be able to put like a load of objects within the scene that you wouldn't normally be able to do in a normal game engine because they're not actually 3d objects to sort of like these particle things it, it, anyway but my point is like the, the tools are actually really simple and the reason why it excites me as a developer more than anything else is that this game or this tool i guess is probably going to inspire like a whole sort of generation of kids that are going to be getting this for christmas like their parents are going to be like oh it's like minecraft right yes it is like that because kids are going to be able to pick this up and actually learn what games developer is and hopefully it'll inspire them and then like in in 20 years time we'll have this whole field of people that be like oh yeah i played dreams when i was a kid and i've always wanted to do it ever since you know uh, this is this is what this thing is and that's why i think it's so important that's why it's like so amazing to me i, I just think it's absolutely incredible uh, what people can do with it and like by itself the tool itself like is really intuitive it's really really simple or it all it is is just like a list of buttons and you're just figuring out the tools the tutorials in the game are absolutely amazing like the way it sort of takes you through to teach you how to do certain things is really easy super intuitive they've clearly made this for like a 10 year old but if you're 30 you can pick this up and still have a great time with it so if you've got any, like I said, any creativity in your bones whatsoever, like go and pick this thing up. You'll you'll probably get something out of it. Even if even if you like boot it up and just go into what they call like the the dreamscape sort of thing, you know, where everyone else's creations are, you could get lost in that shit for days. Just going through what other people have made and what they've done and just playing all their games. Like I I, I came across like some guy that's like clearly a fan of Eco and he's made like this tower. And you sort of ascend the tower, how you get up to the top. And it's it's it basically if the whole game it feels like eco. It's really, really weird, like how well whoever this guy is has like put this thing together. And I was just blown away. And I was playing it for like 45 minutes, just like this is amazing. Like who the hell is this guy? That's cool. Like why why isn't he making games? Yeah, this this and guy's it, like, hey, it's if, stuff uh, like that. if Ueda Fumito isn't gonna make the next uh eco right. shadow, I'm gonna make the tower. Like, I'm gonna fucking make it, yeah. Exactly. And that's that's the great thing about this this tool yeah like there's clearly some questions about piracy and like how media molecule are going to go forward to sort of tackle that sort of stuff but i don't think that's really the conversation to be had right now i think it's more about like let people go nuts with this thing just see what they can do and let's have fun with it because like even if you look at the roster of stuff that's come out even in the past like two weeks since the game's been out it's incredible like there's thousands upon thousands of like what they call dreams but it can be anything from like a diorama to a game to an audio file to an animation it could be anything um it, just hundreds of these things already like i can't even imagine where it's going to be in a year's time from now when when they're still adding to it when the community is getting bigger the fact that this game is like almost half the price of a full title game is incredible because it means that more and more people are going to be able to get access to it which is great and it's probably going to be on playstation plus at some point for free and that that's when it's going to explode and i, I it's really really exciting anyway there's but, a so, yeah someone, I, I can totally understand someone that. had said on a, a podcast they're like hey they should package this with the playstation 5 I'm like hey that'd probably be a good idea absolutely that's going to happen without a doubt um yeah ps5 with two move controllers or two move controller 2.0 or whatever the hell that's going to be like if they do that yeah no brainer like this is probably going to be the next Minecraft and I can totally see why. And if it doesn't take off, then it's everything to do with Sony's bad marketing of the thing. They they've got a great opportunity here to do something really, really amazing. And I hope that they sort of run with it. So cool. yeah. uh, I'll say the, the final thing about this is I, one thing I like about dreams and I've definitely way, way more interested in it at, since, you know, it finally came, has come out and everyone's been talking about it. Yeah. Um, something like Mario maker or even little big planet I mean, no matter what you do, they are essentially platformers at heart. So yep. it's only like, I guess if you want to call like a 2D platformer a genre, it's only one genre, but with dreams, like the, the possibilities are endless. Anything. So it's just, absolutely it, anything. it opens up what you can do and what you can play uh, to 
whatever genre you want really and so that's one exciting part about it that i could see myself playing these levels um and just you know if i'm done if i'm getting sick of one genre just to try something else so yeah i'm uh yeah i mean that's that's the good thing about like the dreamscape or the dream verse or whatever the hell they call it where you jump in you can literally like i was, I was playing a first person shooter where you have to hunt snowmen <laughs> you know and then like three minutes later i was playing that eco thing and it's just like, how the hell are people doing this and then you like you get hold of the tools and then you can actually just play around and like create stuff really really quickly and really intuitively and just uh, yeah and it totally makes sense and you can totally see why they spent so much time on this and i'm so glad that sony give them the breathing room for this thing because it it, it really does deserve it and it's it's incredible it, everyone should go and try it out it's amazing it's, it's quite crazy that um people are already this good at using the tools you know let's just say like you know naughty dog is like really good at figuring out how to make how to squeeze the most out of a playstation console and yeah for example like the last of us at the tail end of the playstation 3 right just imagine what people yep. will be able to do with this once they've actually, you know, had more time to figure out the Dude, systems I can't even and stuff imagine. like that. If they're already doing what they're doing now, I know it's been in beta for yep. for quite a long time, but still, it's it's quite it's quite amazing to see. Yeah, it's insane. It's really insane. I mean, all all I can see is it getting better, you know. And if they start adding more and more support to the thing, like just having a mouse and keyboard support to that thing would just make it explode. I think every single like there's so many people like in the unity sort of community like that are making games on the side and they're trying to figure out these tools and they'll learn how to program which is important it's a part of like games development and stuff but there's just so many of them that are probably just like looking over sideways at dreams right now i'm thinking why don't i just make something in that instead like to pro- prototype stuff out and then if it's if it works in dreams then i can switch back over to uni and actually put all the time and effort that it takes to like make it from scratch because then at least uh, at least I know it's fun at that point, and, and it, it's probably going to become like that sort of tool. It's I don't think I don't think this thing is designed to make a game from start to finish. I, I think it's strictly meant for prototyping sort of thing, and the prototypes which people are making are just incredible. And, the, and yeah, I, I'm really excited to see where this thing goes, and I hope I hope that uh, Sony keeps supporting it in the way that they have. Uh, but the other game I want to talk about, um, I'll talk about next time because we're probably going over on time already but i'm gonna talk about the witcher 3 i finally got around to this thing um about 30 hours into oh, it oh so you i'm only in... busted past like that seven eight ish hour wall yeah yeah i'm through it but uh I, i've got a lot to say about this thing but it's it's yeah I'll, I'll leave that until next time um but i'm i'm playing it i'm probably gonna finish it it's it's gonna be a long haul game but i'm 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 enjoying it so far but yeah we'll we'll get around to that one cool so uh Moving on, uh, this week we're going to be talking about E3, or the lack thereof, I guess, or the future of E3, and, and what's sort of happening to it, because obviously there's a lot of talk in the news recently, with uh, Sony not going to this year's event, which sort of sucks, um, for gamers anyway, like, whether that's a good business standpoint, we'll sort of go into, I guess, at some point in this discussion, but also with the news of Jeff, uh, Jeff Keighley pulling out with the E3 Coliseum, um, there's a lot of uh, talks around um, the ESA sort of mishandling certain things, especially with leaks and hacks and all this sort of weird stuff. Um, we're just going to sort of uh, tackle this whole thing as in to say, where is E3 going? It's probably going to be turning into some sort of digital sort of showcase. And I think Nintendo has sort of led the way on this and it's sort of opened a lot of people's eyes to what can be done instead of a showcase, uh, like a, a conference-based uh, system. And um, we're sort of, thinking about is that a good or a bad thing so uh yeah so sort of diving right into this man like what what sort of uh changes are coming to e3 like what's what sort of caused all this do you think like the the recent sort of changes uh i mean i think probably the esa looking at other kind of trade shows or game shows and and seeing the how they've kind of focused they've moved more uh away from necessarily like journalists only to a yeah. more fan based show is something that they've they've probably seen at other other shows like what like PAX and said, well, you know, it's not we don't need necessarily to wait for the Game Informer magazine. I'm talking like this is years and years ago, but the Game Informer magazine right, yeah, to come out a month later 
you know, and like rushing to the rushing to the store and like, oh, okay, like what happened at E3 because we had no idea what, what what happened there because it was kind of closed doors, and we need we yeah we're way more connected these yeah. days. So we can we're we're watching the live streams. We're like, I mean, we did it ourselves. Like back in what when was that? Like 2016? 2015, 2016, Tw- maybe twenty fifteen. Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, um, yeah, we we sat on the sofa, stayed up all night, watched it, um, and I think everyone's doing that now. And but it's getting even more now with social media. Um, one of the things which stuck out to me, I guess, was the uh, like the announcement of the PS5. But when that came about, Sony, um, all they did was post a picture on their Instagram <laughs> of like the PS5 logo. That's it. That's all they did. It was just one logo, PS5. Uh, it is officially the most liked um, Instagram post in the gaming category of all time ever. I did not know this. And I just saw this now. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's just a fucking logo. That's it. That's that's all they did. They posted the logo, didn't say anything to it. It's like, there you go, there's a logo. And it's not even a nice different logo. It's just like, oh, we just changed the number. Right. Oh, great. Okay. So, and it's gotten like, what? what was, 5.3 million <sighs> likes. 5.3 million. Like, it's ridiculous. I mean, man. you don't need, it's absolutely you bananas. don't need a, a journalist at a gaming centric uh, website to, post something about that yeah. you know you don't you don't need game informer to like post the the image anymore like you all put the image on the front of their magazine right because like have they got 5.3 million readers probably not you know right or maybe they do i'm not sure i have no idea what game informer numbers are but i can't imagine they're always going up because they've had some recent layoffs right i i would actually like to be interesting to know uh the number of people that have moved to the digital version of game informer versus the actual uh, paper magazine print print magazine yeah I, I wonder like in the past couple of years i wonder what that number is but i i don't know it at all but so basically what you're saying is like uh, and i think everyone really knows this like now these companies can go directly to the people that to the consumers for their messaging without that middleman or middle right. person i think like i think this has come about for a lot of reasons and i think nintendo the reason why Nintendo did a lot is because Nintendo had the most fumbles, like to be blunt about it. Like every single E3 stage presence which Nintendo had, they always had like a, a gag reel, like within 30 minutes of their conference being over because they just had so many mishaps. Oh, do you, re- like do you remember? One of those shows. They they debuted the, the Wii U at E3, whatever year that was. It might have been 2012, I think, that came out 2012 in December. But you know how it's yeah. always like will leave you with one more thing, right? <laughs> yeah. And this is what fireworks look like in Nintendo Land. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is E3. You just I did shit like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's shit like that. I mean, I think like the the good thing about having a digital sort of conference, and I think like Nintendo has sort of shown the way on this, is that you can hyper polish and hyper control everything that you do. And the message that you're sort of showing can be finally like perfected to the point that like you you can get every syllable correct to the to the point that everyone knows exactly what yeah. you're sort of showing and that's good and bad i guess like if if it's just a controlled message 100 percent of the time like is that is that always a good thing well look look at like, uh, uh yeah if it's like a you know a, a, a finely finely cut crisp 30 minute vi- uh video versus having yeah. keanu reeves on stage you know there is a bit of right you, you, you do lose some of that right yeah, Potent- absolutely. Potentially. I mean, uh, there is something to be said about that, though. I know, like, Nintendo are, like, sort of a weird case study because everything that they do, like, their fans are just, like, they go nuts over that stuff. And they're always, like, trending on Twitter every time they do, like, a direct. It doesn't matter what game it is or how much it looks like the last one. It's, it, they can do incremental design all day and, and everyone still loves it. And they'll, they'll always be trending on Twitter. So it's sort of like the proof is in the pudding when it comes to that stuff. But, you know, it it does that have diminishing return over time? And that's sort of the worry which I have that obviously Sony are going this way as well. And I think it's only a matter of time before, like if Xbox makes that jump, then uh, E3 is done. You know, like that's that's the ultimate fear is that Xbox is like, oh, okay, well, everyone else has left. So we might as well just either completely take over E3 or we might as well join them and put out our own sort of Xbox thing right, but and just not do the press conferences. Do you think at that point then E3 would just, move more towards a PAX where it's just more of a, a, a show floor presence than a giant, like, you know, here's your, here's your Nintendo direct, here's your state of play. Here's whatever you want to call Microsoft's video that come out around mm. that time. 
and then just it's not about the the stage shows and and those presentations anymore but it's more like hey we want uh people and influencers to come here and stream and game and play some new games and that that's it it's not going to be this giant blowout of things to come within the next couple of years yeah i mean from a business standpoint i totally understand it like a thousand percent i mean e3 like as an institution and, and like what it what it does like the esa like how much they charge for like quote unquote boost space or the show floor like it's millions i mean we're talking millions upon millions of dollars like just to get just to put a booth there and that's before like having a conference there because they can charge whatever it's like where else are you going to go like a t3 you know like this is la like where, where do you want to be and so i sort of get that they're moving away from that just to save a few bucks especially if they can control the message and have this finely tuned sort of product going out to the masses which is just trending on twitter to to meet the people that really matter anyway, which are the consumers. Like, what does it really matter if the um, consumers are getting it at the exact same time as what all the press are getting it? Especially if they have things like Judges Week where all the press, like, spoiler alert, all the, all the press actually go to an event like a month before E3 and they actually get shown pretty much most of the biggest reveals and they get given all the videos in advance sort of thing and, and they sort of get given the heads up they have to sign ndas and all this sort of stuff just so they can prepare so when stuff does get announced they can put content out at the exact same time that it's all hitting so it's good for them it's good for the business and all that sort of stuff uh, from a business standpoint that totally makes sense that they're going towards more digital but from a consumer standpoint like how would you feel about that like how do you like feel about taking that sort of experience of holy shit, that game just got announced and I had no idea about it. Like, how, how, how does that make you feel? Well, uh, yeah, I just want, I just rewatched one of the uh, Pactor episodes where he, they, someone had posed the question, do you think that uh, PlayStation cutting out of E3 is a good thing? And, and Or how do you feel about that? And he said it's, uh, in his opinion, he said it's really, really dumb of them to do that because um, they can put a YouTube video out whenever they want or hold their own press conference. But E3 is a time when a lot of people do turn their eyes towards the gaming industry because they are, well, like we know that at the beginning of June, there's this giant event and more people are paying attention. Like the numbers for people watching, you know, videos and reaction videos and all this stuff is, is huge at that time. And so he's saying... His argument was, eyes are on E3, and the people that want to buy your console are paying attention at this particular moment, so why not use that time that when everyone, or there's more, you know, there's more people, uh, eyes on the screen waiting for the next big thing to be revealed, use, use that time, everyone's paying attention at that time, instead of doing it a month earlier or a month later. I guess they could do it potentially at some other convention because there's plenty of those around that time, like Gamescom or or, or whatever. But uh, I think he he was saying like it's kind of a lo- it's a lost opportunity f- for them to right. just get the message. So out you're at sort that of point. saying, so you're sort of saying like the concentration of attention on that one moment, like it's important to have everyone sort of show up at that time, just because all eyes are there. And if they if they miss it, then well, yeah, and it's it's they might not be interested to go and find it later on. Right, and it's also it's worked in the past, so why change mm-hmm. it if it's not yeah. broken? I mean, like we've we've talked about before, you know, Sony's been really weird with their messaging about the PlayStation Five. We'll see what they actually do when they do it, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, like it would be cool if they were there. Uh, do they need to be there necessarily? No. Um, do we need to have... Yeah, on a technical level, right. I guess, like, they don't need to be there. Do we, do we need them to have a physical stage presentation? Uh, at this point, I don't necessarily... I don't think so. I mean, N- Nintendo has kind of moved from... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the big thing for me, is that, like, sort of comparing Sony to Nintendo sort of thing, because Sony's sort of following in the footsteps of what Nintendo has done. With the state of play. Um, and stuff right exactly i mean the let's let's not be around the bush on this sony are completely copying them <laughs> they ripped they exactly ripped it they ripped that off they are like i'm yeah like let's be fair to nintendo but the difference is is that 
I can understand why Nintendo made that jump. It's because they were terrible at controlling their message at E three every single year. They didn't really get it. It wasn't really for their audience. Oh, I, I, I see totally what you're saying. That. Yeah. Okay. However, Sony, on the other hand, for the last, the last like three E threes that they did have, so like 2018 back, all of their showcases were the best that they ever did phenomenal stuff like the year that like in 2016 i think it was probably their best e3 when they showed off a god of war or 2017 sorry when they showed off god of war for the first time phenomenal like it was one of the best showcases ever that i'd seen like in 2015 i can still remember like show they showed the last guardian famine 7 chimney 3 yeah. and people lost their fucking minds like that because none of that leaked like absolutely none of it. Right. So to go from that to just like going, uh, you know, we're doing really good, so we're just gonna um quit. We're done. We're gonna change up the format completely. And and don't forget, it's kind of wild. Like those, the, all of those E three, uh, were presentations were great. But don't forget, like the last E three presentation we got from Sony was like them leading people, journalists from tent to tent, and then there's a guy playing the banjo, and they like focused True. on those three three or four games, and everyone's like. What are they doing? Was that E three though, or was that uh, PSX? Oh man, which I can't remember. Which one was it? Uh, I, I want to say that was PSX. Was that PSX. I don't know why. It might. I'm not sure. Like maybe maybe I'm wrong. But e- you yeah, might be right. You're right. But, like that, the last that was a fumble. Right. Like the last big kind of presentation they've done, whether that was PSX or E three, was weird, and they're still being weird. So yeah, hopefully, I mean they're doing their own thing for sure. Uh, yeah, if I was to guess, if I was to guess, I think within the next three weeks they're gonna have a sort of blowout. Um, I don't even know if it's gonna be a presser. It's probably gonna be a video, much like Nintendo did with the Switch when they first announced that when they showed off the Switch for the first time. It's probably gonna be something like that. No price. Like this is the console. These are a couple of the games that we're gonna be having with it. This is what the graphics gonna look like. Here's the controller. Um, we'll see you in a few weeks. And then they'll have like a PSX in like August or something, because they they're basically waiting for Microsoft. It's sort of like guns guns at dawn sort of thing at this point. Where uh, are you gonna sell your price first, or are you gonna tell you you know like they're they're basically waiting for each other to see who's gonna pull the price first because they're trying to fight after that stuff because it it basically determined who won the last generation because Sony went a hundred dollars cheaper right. than Xbox last generation. That's that's literally why they won out. Otherwise, it would have been the same thing as the Xbox 360 and the PS3 sort of situation. So I totally understand why they're being so cagey at the moment. But being cagey with certain details, I understand. But like being cagey with absolutely everything is a different thing altogether. It's like you've shown us a logo, a logo which we already knew existed. We already knew it was going to be called the PS5 because you'd already announced, like other games had announced that it was going to, like games were going to be on the PS5 before they even showed that off. So that was a complete waste of time. It's just, yeah, they, they are being really, really weird. So to take all that and then to say, hey, we're not going to E3 this year, even though we've got a console launch to do, how much of a fumble is that? Like, how much is that going to affect them? You know, I wonder. like that's the real question. Like them not going to E3 in a console launch year is sort of bananas. That's like a presidential candidate not showing up to any of the debates, you know? Yeah. It's. It's like, well, where are you going? You know, like, come back. Like, we, we need to see this thing. Yeah, I, I, so, I yeah. mean, I think they might be out for good. But I don't know. Like, I, I still think E3 is, is still an important event for sure in the in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I, th- I think it's important for the excitement. You yeah. Know? I think it's, it's an important time for us as gamers, not necessarily developers or publishers. I know originally it was a trade show for journalists to come and see the games so they could go back to their outlets and report out so their viewers could see it. But it's like we've discussed, that's changed. Sorry, journalists. Like, I'm going to be blunt here, but you're not really necessary anymore in that space. So it's like you were saying before, I think developers really want to have gamers hands-on with the games now so they can like feel like see what the game is so they can go and tell all of their followers because let's i'm going to be blunt about that as well like that they don't really want gamers at the shows they want influencers there they want people that can go onto their facebook pages that have got three million followers and just tell all of or them, like which is another nintendo direct reaction videos 
the, what you know right, it's exactly. like hundreds of those you know like uploaded five minutes after the the direct comes out mm -hmm. and here's an interesting thing look think about like giant bomb right they used to do news stories uh they don't do that anymore yeah why would why, they? Why, why why waste the time i think they've realized like no this is kind of like a personality based like our our cream our our cash cow is the personalities that we hire at, at giant bomb and instead of doing news stuff they do this giant bomb uh, at night e3 thing where you know jeff gersman is is kind of the uh the anchor and they bring on devs to talk about and and other you know giant bomb um uh people that work at giant bomb and they kind of have this kind of round table discussion about like what they saw what they saw and what they played on the show floor and then devs talking about their new games and that's that's yeah. streamed to the internet and that's that's the type of stuff people i think people want to watch they want to watch that not necessarily a news story with like a list of things that have have come out you know reaction videos yeah i think i think i think people are more interested in the conversation around totally. it rather than the news of it sort of thing because they can get the news from anywhere like they log onto twitter they look at the hashtags done there it is you know they they don't need to check that stuff especially if they hit that like the e3 hashtag then it's all right there oh, like why do they need right if you're following like, the right people on twitter like get it give it like a five six minute scroll and you'll get pretty much what you need in terms of news out of that you know yeah which is a massive shame by the way i'm not like advocating any of that like it's it is a shame that like journalists have to go through this sort of crazy change yeah uh, and i i do respect like they've gone through this massive shift over the last few years but it's they've sort of been taken over by the influencer industry now which i don't like i hate that i hate the fact that we've got like these 15 year old kids that are just like hey what's up guys it's your boys you know like on fucking youtube like talking about all this shit and they don't know what the hell they're talking about half the time right and they're the ones that have got the influence they're the ones that get the get the deals they're the ones that are invited to these shows and then there's there's people at the smaller outlets that are doing damn good work that should be invited to them things and they're not anymore right which is which is a massive shame which is worrying to me because uh, apparently with the changes to E3, I think the ESA put out this uh, this post about uh, yep. how they're kind of rebranding E3, I think is the term they use. You know, they're doing like lounge areas, more floor streaming, a general redesign of the E3 floor. But they also had said this is going to be a fan media and influencer festival and they will yeah. create, quote, exclusive appointment only activations for select attendees who will create buzz and FOMO. And the thing that worries me about that is the influencer side of it. Like these people didn't Same. go to jour journalism school. They don't, they didn't learn about being fair and, and um, unbiased and having journalistic in integrity. These are kids that all of a sudden, and I'm painting them all with a very broad brush here just to prove a point. Yeah. We're generalizing, yeah, of course. They, you know, make their money on like reaction videos of like overreactions, uh, and are playing kind of like characters, like to to fuel the hype. And all of a sudden, you know, hey, you you have you're getting a million hits on this. How about let's do you know let's do a uh, a branding together type of thing. Like they didn't go to journalism school. They don't they didn't know about like they don't have a general like ethics code. Or right, they, that's they that's study my problem. And learn about these things. It's just like, yeah, fuck it, man. Like, give me that Mountain Dew and, and Doritos. This is awesome. I, I'm 21 <laughs> yeah. years old doing hype reaction videos, and uh, I'm making good money. It's like I I can't trust. I can I how how would I why would I trust their opinion on on anything? Right, coming out of their yeah. Show. I mean, I think that's that's my major worry about all of this and like bringing this back around to like the e3 side of it is that while yeah e3 is actually quite small like in terms of numbers like of how many attendees that they actually have but the the reach that it has maybe someone would argue is twice as much as like the the bigger game shows you know like that's that's the like the sort of gravity that e3 has is that people watch it and they know what it is and they they like the i i used to do it when i had a normal nine to five job before like i started working in the games industry i used to book the like the few days off work just to watch it you know and my my sort of worry is is that if they're catering way too much towards influencers at the shows themselves then we're going to get all this hyper controlled like weird messaging so we're not really going to trust any of it anymore 
And then what else is going to happen is like, everyone's going to start doing these digital shows. And my fear is, is that the digital shows are just going to get further and further away from E3. And then E3 as sort of a, you know, like the center of sort of gravitational pull for all of this stuff just starts to fade to the point where we have something in August, something in July, something in January, you know, and it's so spread out that it's sort of, it's diffused and it's not as impactful and it's not as exciting. And it's, and the problem with that, and it's like a lot of people think, yeah, that's great. You know, like more information all the way through the year, you know, we we're constantly getting updates. Like there's no more video games dry season. This is awesome. You know, but the problem with that is like you just mentioned before what Pacta said. And as a developer, it sort of terrifies me as well. Is that if you're, if you're, if you're not like having eyes on absolutely one pinpoint area, then you can't just passively show games, which nobody knows about sort of thing. So for like a Call of Duty, Call of Duty doesn't need to be E3. Everyone knows what it is. It's there every year. But what's the flip side of that? There's a lot of games that never reach like public sort of, you know, people don't, will never see them because they'll skip certain digital shows like oh, i'm not really interested in sony like i'm a nintendo guy so i'm not going to watch that or oh, you know I'm, I'm not really into bethesda games so i'm going to skip their show in september or whatever so it's sort of it takes eyes off that so it like it's a lot of less attention on these sort of niche games so what then happens is that like even further down the rabbit hole like publishers start only making safer games like we're only going to make games which will get the attention like we're not going to make these unique different experience like dreams like would dreams come about like if if all of this split up i don't know you know and it's that them sort of questions which i sort of worry about and i hope that that doesn't happen for that reason i i do hope that even if they move if everyone moves to like a digital format of releasing information around e3 i i I do hope they they continue to select specific like indie games and and highlight like hey we're not just about the yeah the, the big games we're gonna put the the guy who created unravel on stage and he's like like, right and that guy was like crying it's like i can't believe i'm here like or we're gonna show you we're gonna devote a a, a decent amount of time to sea of solitude or vain exactly some of these games like and it's stuff like that the my my major worry is that they then create a an indie showcase um show only so like there's a digital event which is just indie titles only who is going to watch that Hmm. Is it going to be the same amount of people that watch the Sony ones or the Nintendo ones? Hell no. You know, and that's 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 the problem. Like you start splitting these things up and you start shifting them around. Sales are going to get hit pretty hard for certain people. Yeah, for the big AAA developers, no, not really. Like that they they're probably going to see the benefit of this, but at someone else's cost, you know. And that's that's the major worry which I have. But I don't know. I mean, sort of to wrap this thing up, man, like what do you what would you hope would happen with E3, like going forward? Because obviously stuff does need to change, but what is your, like, what's the ideal sort of thing you would like to see, I guess? Like, do you think pe- things need to change or do you think it's just, it's changing with the times that even if you don't like it, like it should like change completely digital? Like, what, what do you think? Well, I'm not necessarily worried or, or disappointed if they move from like having a stage presence to doing like a digital format. And then just right. having that that uh, that week where people go and play these games, and then we hear about them on podcasts. Uh, for me, because I don't watch influencer YouTube channel stuff, um, mm-hmm. but that's just me. My worry is they're going to focus more on that, and they've said as much, saying there we're ex- we're giving appointments, exclusive appointments for select attendees who will help create buzz and FOMO. And to me, that sounds like we're giving this stuff to influencers because they hype, they yeah. hype the crap out of our games and they're yes men and they're not journalists. They're not going to give us hard, hard ball questions. They're just happy to be there and, you know, making money off of it. But, um, you know, I'm going to be focused on listening to what the giant bomb crew or, you know, Shane and Matt and sifted have to say about the games that they played on the show floor. Uh, yeah. but I am worried that they're focusing more on, using influencers to get the message out and i don't know i mean as a whole i'm worried that it might totally be this like giant i guess e3 is kind of like a giant hype train but like this yeah giant hype train that 
is using influencers as the coal to power it is kind of like not what I want to see. But like, yeah, what else does what else do they do at this point? If, uh, you know, they want to make uh, they see the success of other game shows or game events from around the world where it is more consumer focused in that way. And uh, now that we have big publishers, you know, passing up on using or buying out space on the show floor like uh, like what do they do you know so uh I, yeah i don't necessarily like the way it's going but i'm not 100 percent sure it's going to get to the ridiculously like what is that movie with luke wilson not evolution oh. idiocracy right like a weird okay. like alternate world idiocracy level of of what could happen at, at E3 with just people mm-hmm. with hype hats on going, oh my God, like streaming from the show floor with the fucking GoPros. Yeah, but it's kind of, it's kind of, it's almost getting like yeah. that now though, you know, like that's, that's the crazy thing about it. And I, I know that like, obviously publishers want that because they want the hyper controlled sort of hype message that's going out there. So people are only getting like the exciting side of stuff. But I think like the good thing about having journalists there is that they're they're a lot more objective they ask the hard questions you know and that's that's kind of what i like about the stage presence is that if a game like fucks up or glitches or breaks or something it's like huh look human you know sort of thing like that's right like i know this game is real like it's not like completely polished which is another argument against the digital you know chris right i mean obviously that's that's a yeah, that's a, that's a dumb argument to have, I guess. Like, yeah, I want to see the games break. You know, like that that's not a good, really, like a point to put across. But, you know, it, it at least keeps it a bit more realistic. Like, I actually know that they're being truthful or honest about certain things. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, for me personally, I, I, I don't know, like, how I feel about it. Like, I understand it from a business sense, like, why they're making these changes and why they're calling for the ESA to do these certain things. And I understand that, like, the digital sort of way forward is going to be the future of it but the caveat sort of worry to that is the influence side you know like how how are they gonna affect our industry to the point that it is it is it going to make it a negative sort of side to it like am i going to be excited about e3 when influencers are reporting reporting like like the the information back to me like in like what was my most excited time of the year like when I've got like a 15 year old go like, Oh my God, I just played the most amazing game ever in the whole, in the whole world. And it's like, no, you didn't like tell us what the game is, articulate it properly and actually like convey information to us. Because a lot of the time that's the thing about E3. Like a lot of the time there are things behind closed doors that they only show to certain people. And then if you get an influencer go into one of those closed door sessions and they come out and do a YouTube video and they either say the wrong thing or they've, they've articulated it in a really weird way to the point that you're like, oh, okay, so that's in the game. And then the game comes out and it's not actually in the game. And you're like, wait, but that guy said you could do this. And like, what's going to happen when all that sort of stuff gets too hairy. Right. Yeah. You know, they're not, it's, they're, they're I, not I trained know. to, uh, they don't have all the tools needed to like properly maybe ask the right questions yeah. or, or make sure they're, they're, they're on tasks and, getting the information 100% correct because you know that's they're working for an employer like a giant website that re- that relies right. on people journalists being as accurately as possible it's just some 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 kid and him being wrong or giving inf- misinformation it's like not going to hurt the youtube channel yeah. necessarily anyway um uh, yeah. one one thing which i my sort of hope my my perfect sort of like scenario out of all of this which i would hope would happen is that all of the game companies sort of get together because the competition is good always like even at e3 it is good like working as a developer like when you're in a studio like you constantly walk past walls and walls upon walls of just awards for best game of the show runner-up nominated game of the show and they're proud of that you know like the studio i work in they're really really proud of that like whenever they they get a nomination or they they win game of the show and even there, the microcosm of E3, like the competition even there at that level is important. And it pushes us as developers to do better. You take that away, I'm not sure what's going to happen. So I hope like going forward that they have, they will all have digital videos instead. So they'll have like an E3 styled state of play. They'll have an, e, an E3 
obviously like Nintendo Direct, like Microsoft to do all that thing. And I hope that they sort of negotiate to have all them play on the same day, like during an E3. So even if there isn't like a convention floor, or maybe there is, and it's just like play booths only for the influencers, I'll ignore all of that shit. At least I get all my hype out of them five videos as a consumer. But then after that as well, throughout the year, they have like these specific events like ea have started doing ea play over the last few years that's been really successful for them sony like didn't do it last year but they've had playstation experience which has been hit and miss like they've only been doing it a couple of years though so that might get better so it's it still has it still has the importance of e3 in terms of like keeping everyone's attention on that sort of that week but also having their own controlled messages separated out I think that would be the best way going forward, but I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to see. I guess maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe maybe publishers have got a completely different idea in the works, especially with the new generation coming along. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess we'll. See. I think the the continuation of this will be after E3 this year. You know, because mm-hmm. by that time we'll yeah, we'll sure. know a lot and then see how they've pivoted since since right. the year before and uh, how they've changed stuff up. So we'll we'll probably talk about that at, uh, sometime in mid June. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know like with, I know this conversation really started happening maybe two years ago. I think that's when it really started to ramp up, especially when EA, I think it was when EA dropped out. I think that's when it really started to like get pretty serious. Like EA were like, oh, we're not going to E3. And everyone was like, what do you mean? You're not going to E3? Are you crazy? And then it worked for them and they didn't go to E3 and it sort of like didn't really affect the show too much because it was still within that week and they had ea state of play in la where people could go from the convention center it was only like maybe 30 minutes away which is still a pain in the ass for like journalists or whatever but it's still it's still during the same time so it's still a part of that gravitational pull of e3 my concern is as i mentioned before is that it just stuff starts to float further and further away from that week it's like why would we have it that same week when we can have less competition and do it the next week or the week before and then that turns into two weeks the next year and then three weeks the next year and then a month and then a year you know and it slowly like grows apart and then e3 is no longer a thing that's that's my main concern and i hope that doesn't happen because as a consumer it excites me every single year to see it and i i think that's important like just to have that excitement to be a part of that community and sort of keep everyone interested and looking at one area for one week because like they they might see a game which they thought that they would never like but they see the trailer for it and like oh that looks cool i might pick that up when they wouldn't have done that anyway because i don't like bethesda games why would i watch their show thing you know like all that changes when you start compartmentalizing all this sort of stuff so i don't know but yeah uh, any final thoughts before we wrap this thing up uh no no i think that's that, that's it i mean we'll we'll see where it goes i just um yeah you know still excited for it and it's it's not completely overhauling everything about the show. Like it's the show will go on. No, it's not. It's say, nowhere so. near. It, yeah, it's it's definitely got a wound in its side right now. Right. But I don't I don't think it's anywhere near dead. Like we're saying, it's the beginning of the end. I would say, but it's not the end yet. Hopefully, hopefully, E three can sort of adapt and overcome, and sort of cater towards uh, the new generation of gamers. Because clearly, this generation of gamers is completely different from the previous generation, which is our generation. They're, they're used to this YouTube influencer sort of industry, and, and we're not. So we've got to move with the times because they're the ones going to be buying the games, I guess. So yeah. we'll see. Hey, we shall see. But the Turbo Graphics, mi- uh, Turbo Graphics 16 Mini is coming out in, in the month, so no, no complaints at this point in my life. <laughs> at this time, indeed. Yeah, we're going to have to do a special episode. Oh yeah. It. All right. Yeah, we'll see. But I, I need to get hold of one because they don't sell them in Canada. Oh, no. Which is, yeah, which is horrible. But I'll I'll try and get one imported from America. I'll I'll, I'll get it. Don't worry. Good. Just for you. Awesome. We'll figure it out. But yeah, uh, to all of our listeners, thank you for tuning in. Um, if you've got any thoughts about uh, sort of E3 and where it's going, like what, how do you feel about all of this? You know, like do you would you prefer a digital sort of way forward? There's a lot of people out there that are saying they would, and then there's obviously a lot of older school traditional people like us that are just like no keep it like showcase floor i want to see all the all the gaffes like the, i'm gonna miss the e3 gaffes you know so yeah if you if you've got any opinions then uh please come and tweet us where you can find us at coffee beer cast on twitter and you can also find us any on any of your podcast services and if we're not on one of your podcast services wow can't talk anymore then please let us know uh where you do listen to your podcast and then we'll add it to our list of uh platforms um so from 
both of us. Thank you for listening, and we will uh, catch you guys next time. Ta ta. Right. See ya. Oh wait, Evan, where can people find you? <laughs> I just, I just felt like, eh, it's not that important. Yeah, fuck yeah. it. It's too, it's too late. See you, see, see yeah. you next time. All right, everyone. Bye. Bye.